doctoral candidate, and my topic is asexual, asexual activism as an emerging sexual and gender social movement. In other words, I'm both a social anthropologist and I'm a, a social movement theorist. And so I'm kind of here to tell you a little bit about the research that I'm doing on that. And the two main questions that I'm looking at in terms of my research is to consider self-defined asexual activists' own narratives of the repertoires of engagement that they've pursued. In other words, I'm really not hugely interested in, in, in kind of going up to people and saying, I need to tell you who you are as, a, as, a, as, a, as an asexual. Or, or having a kind of list and ticking it off and saying, ah, oh, you'll do. If you tell me you're an asexual, if you tell me you're an activist, that's enough. And then, I, and then what I'm interested in are repertoires of engagement. Social movement theory has a whole history of looking at politics. But what it gets very iffy about is sex and gender. Because social movement theory is very male. And it likes dealing with what it sees as very, very kind of serious male things. You know, like unions. <laughs> and war. And the real politics. But, you know, it wouldn't want to go to a trans parade. That wouldn't be like social movement. Social movement theory tends to like to be very unemotional. Does lots of stuff like that. So, lots of us are beginning to try and take social movement theory and move it a bit into working with sex and gender, because we actually think sex and gender movements are actually real social movements as well. And it's about time that it worked in perhaps what we would see as a bit more of a feminist approach. Okay? The other thing I'm interested in doing is to compare the narratives to the broader social, historical narratives of the LGBTIQ plus umbrella. I do apologize that I'm reading this out to you, which I don't really think you should ever do when you're when you've got a PowerPoint, but as I've said to you, I'm slightly a bit dazed from the heat, and I'm doing this so that I remember what I'm saying. What I'm saying. Um, basically, pride also is a social movement. It's a very big social movement. And it's got certain kinds of stories it likes to tell. They're mostly sexual stories. Okay? Asexual stories are now becoming part of that. Is that an easy melt? Does it happen well between the two? You know, do we just take one story? Do we take the other? Do we put them together? You know, because there's a history of it going right back to the women's movement. The women's movement, and it all begins with, with the women's movement. It doesn't begin with the lesbian and gay movement. It begins right back then. And do those movements come together well? So it's kind of like, how do we look at that? How do we look at that kind of melding that's going on? Is it okay? Is it all happy? Or are we all sitting around singing Kumbaya at the storytelling fire? Or are we all kind of like a different kind of going, no, 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 this is my story. Mm -hmm. so that's kind of the kind of things that I'm interested in. Okay, traditionally, and this is very much talking about the British approach. I know that there are North American researchers here, so I, I really want to say that. This is, this is the British approach. Research on sexuality and gender, it's tended to focus on two kinds of approaches. Psychology of identity and sociology of identity. In other words, when we've tended to look at our, when, when scientists have tended to look at our communities, we've tended to want to do one, two things. We've tended to want to measure us, in other words, orientation, tell us who we are, or labeling, you know, what's wrong with you or what's right with you. And that's been the two main approaches. And actually, sometimes that's important. It's important. I'm not going to run that down totally. You know, it's important that those approaches go on. You know, that, that, okay? The other thing about both those approaches is they tend to research the individual. They tend to be about speaking to individuals. The kind of approach that I, I use, or that my research is about, is interdisciplinary. It's looking at ideas from three different research approaches. First of all, the sociology of social movements. How groups mobilize to achieve social change. 
In particular, it uses an, a concept called Wung, which comes from a guy called Tilly. Acts of worthiness, unity, numbers, commitment. And because I'm a, I, I'm a feminist, we also talk about emotion and affect. The best example of Wong that I can give you is this entire event is a Wong. Okay? You are all here uh, as asexuals. You are, sh you are creating an, an act of visibility. You are not simply being separate people. You are being part of something. You are, but, but that is also part of a larger event, which is pride. So one act of what, what each of those, those that's how act, Tilly, who is, the, who is the particular social theorist on social movements, says, says that acts of social, cause, social movements work. But you don't just do that because it's, because it's political. You do that because you feel emotionally compelled by certain kinds of scripts to do it. And this is where sexuality and gender comes in. And the plumber, who is the, another theorist that I use, says that we do this because we're responding to, we need to tell stories, that our stories are really important to us. But he, said, he says something else. He says that it's not just that we're telling stories. He says that we can only tell those stories if people are willing to listen to them. And this is what makes you particularly important at this moment. What makes asexual and asexual activists so important is that I think you guys, you folks, are being listened to because this is your moment. In the past, there was a particular moment when the women's movement, because of particular socio-historical scripts, came to a, moment, a tipping point. Then in the 1950s, the 1960s, the lesbian and gay, gay, gay communities emerged in the city for specific historical moments. Trans is then, now, then emerged. Emer emerge and it, as people are now beginning to talk about the tipping point with trans. As a researcher, what is interesting about a asexuality and asexual activism is you are just emerging now and offer the potential to researchers to actually see an emerging sex and gender social movement just at that point when that when a social movement, a sex and gender social movement is actually beginning to emerge in its nascent form, and which we've not really done before, and actually begin that process, which is where cultural anthropology comes in and begins to produce their own stories. So in order to do that, as a theorist, I've been using these set of methods. I've been doing a series of interviews with asexual activists, which has been keeping me very tired, because you're all over the world, and some of the, so, I, so my sleep patterns have been incredibly disrupted, but it's been incredibly inspiring. Some of them are, are here, and I'd like to really say thank you to them because it's, it has been truly inspiring, and and I have about 60 hours of interviews. Um, the next section is discourse analysis which involves looking at particularly something which is very specific, uh, and in the literature is here, is someone I've spoken to about this, and it's an idea of his which I'm using, which is that one thing that's very specific to asexual activism is the way that you use case studies, and the way that you use case studies to tell your story, and to share your stories across the, across the net. And the third thing that I've been doing is that I've been engaging in participant observation focusing on pride events. I'm probably going to go to about 15 pride events this summer, and I may never want to see another one by the end of the summer. I promise you, I hadn't been to one for five years before this, but by the end of the summer I will be to 15 or so. Looking at asexual participation, and also at the responses of other, of other LGBTIQ plus star to, I keep forgetting all of the notes, as I said, I, my brain's a bit tired at the moment. To, um, to start to see the way that these different stories work together. Okay. I'm still in the data collecting stage of my project, and any conclusions are tentative. 
However, the one thing I would say is that there are tensions between the narratives that asexual activism, it appears to me, espouse, and the head, what could be said to be the hegemonic narrative, which is espoused by the Pride Umbrella. Pride Umbrella is very, very, very strongly uh, pushed towards a theme of suffering, surviving, and surpassing. And it's very, very strongly pushed towards that in the view, favor of a particularly forged by the experiences of particularly gay, gay men and lesbians in the 1980s and the 1990s. The extent to which that is actually opened up, not just to asexuals, but to other groups, and to their actual experiences of oppression, is actually quite moot. And I have to say, listening to some of the narratives of activists, the extent to which they, they actually feel despite actually recounting what seemed to me to be quite, quite definite examples of, of prejudice, but they, which they then ameliorate and say, but of course that's not the same as what happens to gay men and, and lesbians. And that's a recurring theme in the research that I've done. It leads me to suspect that there's almost a sense of, um, of, false, of false consciousness if people know what I mean. There's almost a sense like, yes, this, the bad thing might have happened to us, but of course it's never as bad as what happened to, to gay men. It's never as bad as what happened to lesbians, particularly in the 1980s. And although I need, I need to do a little bit more research on that, but it does seem that that's a recurring theme, and having spoken to some other researchers who I know in, in Britain, actually that's a theme that they're beginning to see reflected in their own work. I have to say that's the result that's appeared in my research, and it's the result that's appeared in the, result, the work of people I know in Britain. Uh, whether that will be replicated in other parts of the world, I'm not so sure, but the, a lot of the respondents that I was speaking to had come from other parts of the world. So, um, thank you.